this light is killing me. Yeah. yeah. So you're from Sweden? I'm from Croatia. Oh, Croatia. I, I just but, I just uh, lived for 10 years in Sweden. I see. Uppsala, yeah, that's a Swedish university, right? Yeah. 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 So. Okay. Nice. Nice place. I, I, I love the nice coast. <laughs> yeah. Let's wait for two more minutes. Some still mm -hmm. uh, here, and also this elevator is a kind of disaster here in this project. Here in this. Yeah, sometimes you have to call it uh, always for like five minutes. You know, so open your seat yeah. for the cars and with the pads. <laughs> yeah. So it's not 15 minutes as in Europe that you wait. You're for us, you probably wait. So when you when did you come to the US? Uh six years ago. Six. Six. Okay, yeah. I see. So I was in. I was at MIT yeah, for. Yeah. yeah. We discussed you know, some of the you know, chance talk. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're good. I think we'll just X out of this. Um, and then okay. uh, start webinar. Start webinar. Yeah. Start. I think so. Yeah. I mean, we're ready to go, right? Yeah. And then she, if you can just announce into the yeah. microphone. Here. Can I get started? Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Hey. Good morning. Where? There is the mic's not. Can you guys hear me? No. Uh -oh. uh -oh. Is it not right? It's not uh, working. It's not working. Mike's no. supposed to work. I don't know if my I think Mike's uh, working. Mike, I don't know. Hold on, hold on. Let's see, Mike. Uh, wait, is this? Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. Wait, so that one was off. That's off. Wait, so then... Oh, wait. She hears you, though. Huh. Alexis hears you. Why is Nick coming in the room? <laughs> Maybe just speak loud. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's but I can show. Alexis says she can hear, but that yeah. I, but I'm not. Sure. No Is my mic working? Yeah, your mic. Mic mic's yeah, working. Hear you. So maybe. Do you want to borrow it? Okay, I can borrow. It. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Do that. Okay. okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can. Uh, good morning. Good morning, let's get started. Um, welcome everyone to BME seminar series hosted by Department of Biomedical Engineering at the Columbia University. My name is Chi Wen and I'm associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Today we continue to offer our lecture in a hybrid format with both virtual and live audience. Our speaker will present for approximately 40 to 45 minutes and we will leave for 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. For our virtual audience, throughout the presentation, please use Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen uh, to submit questions. We will try to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end. For our live audience, you will have a chance to ask your questions during Q&A session as well. So today we are very excited to have our newest member, our faculty member, um, to uh, the Professor Sanya Viskovic. Okay, I'm right. Okay, cool. Thank you. 
Um, Sanya is a core faculty member of BME department and also the director of technology innovation app at the uh, New York Genome Center. She holds joint appointment as assistant professor at uh, uh, Fu Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and uh, Herbert and uh, Florence Ivan Institute for Cancer Dynamics at Columbia University. She is also Wellenberg Academy Fellow of Royal Swedish Academy uh, of Science and the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering. Wow, you're close to the girl, right? <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> yeah, well, uh, and Professor um, Wiskowicz is an experienced and accomplished engineer and the innovator of special transcript to mix technology called Visium, for which we are using, and now commercialized by 10X Genomics. Welcome, Sonia. Okay. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, let me try to just start the presentation and share the screen and make sure everything is working. Okay, let's get started. Um, so I'll probably be walking around the room because that light is a little bit uh, getting in my eye, to be honest. Uh, but, uh, you know, let's get started. So um, as, uh, as introduced, you know, I work a lot on spatial and single cell genomics and technology development that has to do with genomics. Um, I have a background in um, um, engineering. Um, and did my PhD in genetics. And after which I kind of did a lot of computational biology at MIT and I just recently joined um, Columbia, Columbia and the New York Genome Center. So, you know, with, with, with a lot of background in genomics and genetics, if you've ever analyzed data, you know uh, how hard it is to analyze that data given data sparsity and given kind of confounders in your data. And what do I mean by that is that you know, you can take tissues from patients and these tissues may degrade over time. Um, you have to control for a lot of these parameters. And, you know, it's not just about how the tissue is collected, it's when it's collected, what other risk factors the, the patient was exposed to. So um, when it started in this field of, of technology development um, almost 15 years ago, um, we wanted to uh, address one particular question, and that is, how can we develop genomics technologies with applicability to the clinics? So we asked one simple question, which of these technologies in the clinics is used every day and has potentially the largest impact? And we, of course, came, came about pathology. So what you're looking at in this uh, picture is, you know, uh, tissue microarray which this means that it's um, 50 circles. In these 50 circles, uh, you have a representation tissue from 50 patients, and you're looking at 50 colorectal cancer patients. Um, and then a pathologist will look at the pink and purple shading of these cells, and you know these have been stained with a particular um, dye. And based on this shading and the shape and size um, of these cells and how the cells are connected in the tissue, the pathologist, after years and years of training, can make a diagnosis. And then potentially, um, based again on the, the expertise of that particular pathologist, uh, he can potentially say something about the grading of that cancer, which stage the disease is at. Um, again, sometimes this pathologist could help get help from staining from a couple of markers. This basically means that, you know, um, some of the diseases we've studied for many years, uh, for example, in breast cancers, we have the HER2 marker. Uh, we can stain these tissues for a HER2 marker and see if any of the cells pop up as positive and how many cells pop up as positive and where these cells are located. Um, however, it's, it's actually extremely hard with this type of data to make the NOVA discoveries. And this is because there is, back then there was no high throughput way to analyze all the markers at the same time from these tissues. So we were dependent on these discoveries that were already made and staining the tissues with one to two markers. Um, so we asked, what can we do about this problem? Um, <clears throat> so we come up with an idea uh, that seemed pretty simple at the time. It just took a long time to get it to work. 
um, is that if we take any single tissue from the previous slide and we ask the question, well, what would happen if we split each of these tissues into a grid? And what would happen if we extract in each and single part of this grid some type of genome-wide information? So that means that you would either you know, do DNA or RNA sequencing of parts of this tissue. Um, and then I'm highlighting, for example, two parts of this tissue. They're orange and blue. Um, and each part of this grid, we then term tissue voxels. Um, so that's kind of a popular term in image processing terminology. Um, and then we wanted to design an assay that does sequencing in each of these voxels, not just the orange and blue one, absolutely all the voxels uh, in the tissue. Um, I, I've noticed my mic turned off for a second. No. Where is the button? Nope. Nope. Okay. Maybe we need a. Sorry for that. Give us a sec. No, it's not green, the, the light anymore. Oh. Battery dead. Yeah, battery's out. Yeah, battery's out. No. Oh, she can hear, but, but the room, hear room cannot hear it. I know. Is there a charger we can connect? Did you hear the mics? Are, I, yeah, I, the noise I, you scan yeah, the I try to, I turn okay. all of them on. Does okay. Happen? Yes, I know. Uh, no. And then I, yeah, everyone is a pretty low. Hmm. I think I think it probably uh, because the source on the Zoom is different. I mean, maybe if but, you stand here and speak loud enough for the room that I Zoom here, would that be okay? We yeah, they mentioned some of them. Okay. Yeah. Let's do like this. Turn. Can we turn the mic over there and I'll try to speak to the room? Yeah. So we don't good. lose so we don't lose too much time. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. I, I okay. Hear voices loud. Yeah. I mean if, uh, maybe ask yeah. Yeah. So um okay. So we're doing this old school. Um actually giving a lecture and not standing behind the podium. Um okay. So we, we start by saying, okay, what would happen if you could extract RNA or DNA sequencing information from each and single walk voxel or part of the grid from the tissue? So, you know, many technologies back then were continuously talking about splitting tissue into pieces. Well, that's inherently very, very hard to do and how to do that reproducibly. So instead of actually splitting the tissue into a grid, we first created a grid. Um, this grid we call a facially barcoded microarray, which you see on the upper left-hand corner. Um, so we produced a grid as a matrix. Back then, when we published in 2016, this was a matrix of 33 times 35 spots. Could you stand a little bit closer to the podium so we can see one? <laughs> okay. Um, right. And what was unique about this grid is that... Uh, you know, we wanted to somehow encode with DNA where the positions on the grid are. So how we actually did that is that uh, we ordered, if it's 33 times 35 matrix, that's approximately 1,000, okay? So we ordered 1,000 different oligos from IDP. And each of these DNA oligos um, had an encoded ATGC sequence that was a little bit different from one another. Uh, that means that we deposited a very particular DNA sequence uh, into position in the upper left corner um, that encoded position 1-1 in a grid. 
Uh, then we took a little bit different DNA oligo and we sprayed it on position one, two, just next to it. Then we took the third DNA oligo and we repeated this for position one, three in the Cartesian coordinate system. Um, when we were done with producing the grid, what happened is that if we zoom into the middle is that each of these spots carried its own DNA primers, okay? But it didn't carry a copy of one DNA. So each spot that was 100 micron in diameter carried probably 200 million copies of the same DNA primer. And then this, this repeated for all the positions or all the spatial spots in our grid. Um, and then if we zoom in on the uh, far right side, what we see is that how, how these DNA oligos that we bought from IDP were designed that you had this spatial barcode, which is the ATCG sequence encoding the grid on your glass slide. Uh, it was preceded by an Illumina adapter, and then on the top, it had the PolyD detector. So all of us that have been doing a lot of uh, Illumina sequencing and genomics definitely recognize this as a typical RNA seq um, library. Um, after, what can you then do when you deposited, you know, millions and millions of oligos on a glass slide that are Illumina sequencing compatible? So after that, you actually take a tissue. You slice that tissue, you put it on your spatially barcoded microarray, then you do H and E staining, which is the same type of staining that the pathologist was doing in that first slide when we were looking at the tissue microarrays. Um, after you stain your tissue, you image your tissue. So now you're recapitulating all this beautiful morphology and histology that every single pathologist every day looks at, uh, but you're also encoding where your tissue is on the grid which we later on use in the computational steps. But now the most important comes, part comes in the lower panel. Um, so instead of, as I said, splitting the tissue, we first recreated the grid. We place the tissue on top of that grid, and now we want to extract information from the tissue that it flows down onto the grid. So we do a bunch of uh, very controlled enzymatic reactions. The mRNA molecules drop down and flow on our spatially barcoded microarray surface. They hybridize through the poly A tail in the mRNA and the poly D2 capture sequence on our DNA oligos on our spatial grid. Um, when that binding happens, now we can do a reverse transcription reaction on the surface. That means that we are using an enzyme to copy the mRNA information on top of our grid. When that step is done, uh, basically you're, uh, you have a molecule that's very stable. You have positionally copied transcriptional information uh, onto a solid surface. And now you can collect these spatially barcoded mRNA cDNA hybrids, and you can go into just regular pair dandy Illumina sequence. So um, if we want to visualize what these results mean is that so before sequencing, you're dealing with the same information that currently you have in hospitals. So that's the regular H and E state. But after sequencing, you know how I said that pathologists can somewhat, sometimes get help from one marker, right? The HER2 marker in breast cancer. Well, now in each of these spots or each of these tissue voxels, we are encoding thousands of genes worth of information, not just one. So we went from one to 10,000 in one single assay. Um, so we published this paper in 2016. I was wrapping up grad school and, you know, it took us eight years to develop it. But then I was like, okay, we've talked so much about applying it in the clinics. Let's go try and find a, a cool project to work on. Um, and the first thing we did is we asked, well, you know, what would happen? And I don't know many of you work maybe in the brain is that there was an, in, there's an institute, the Allen Brain Atlas Institute, um, who tried to do this exactly same thing um, by using one gene at a time state. So for example, you know, the pathologist was using HER2. In the, in, in the brain, we know a lot more targets than we know in breast cancer. So the Allen Institute went through this task of staining thousands and thousands and thousands of tissues with thousands and thousands and thousands of different antibodies uh, to basically recapitulate spatial organization of all these 20,000 genes uh, in the brain. What we can do with our technologies, what took them probably 10 years to do, we can now do in two days. 
So that was the level of kind of resolution and throughput we achieved with this method. Um, to apply it, um, maybe I should just remove the cursor. Know if that will help remove that top part yeah. hopefully um well i'll continue anyways <laughs> the, mouse, the mouse is down uh in this thing over there okay. yeah um <laughs> okay um so apart from like applying it in the mouse brain, when you work with technologies, it's probably uh, the first system you would go to because it's well studied. We, we know how the cells behave, how they're distributed, where it's what the organization looks like, right? Uh, but then we, we try to do a little bit harder problem. So can we apply this technology to study disease? So we paired with Professor Samal Patnani, who is currently at uh, Columbia University Medical School, and is also core faculty member at the Neuro Genome Center. Um, so we asked whether we can study ALS. So to be honest, 2016, 17, I didn't even know what ALS was, uh, but you know, since then we've learned and I've learned a lot about it. Um, so ALS is motor neuron disease, uh, which basically means, as the name says, is that your motor neurons die over time. What we know about ALS is that motor neurons that die over time are located in a very particular part of the spinal cord. So it either starts in the lumbar or the bulbar part of the spinal cord. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, I would say in all cases, it's still fatal three to five years after diagnosis. Um, and what else we know about ALS is that well, the more the motor neurons die, the more severe the symptom the patient has. And again, unfortunately, three to five years later, uh, the patient dies. Uh, there are a couple of known genes that uh, are implied in uh, development of ALS, uh, but you know, 90% of all ALS cases are sporadic. Uh, what we also know about motor neuron loss in this particular part of the spinal cord is that it involves self-autonomous and non-autonomous process. This basically means, well, you know, we know the motor neurons die, but we know they die because of their environment, not they just don't decide to die from nowhere, right? Uh, so I think this was a, a good, good um, question to ask with spatial transcriptomics. Um, because we know we, we had to measure uh, gene expression spatially, and we knew we had to measure it over time as the disease progresses. Um, in order to do this, um, we, in about one year worth of time, created uh, so far still the largest spatial data set that exists. Um, so we profiled over 1,900 tissue sections with ST, and these tissue sections you see as basically virtual stacks here on the left. Um, and each of the, the dark spots basically denotes one of those spatial spots on the grid. Um, highlighted is the part uh, of the spinal cord called the ventral cord. These, this is the part where the motor neurons reside and the motor neurons then die. On the right hand side, you actually see um, <clears throat> overlay of the full data set we have. Uh, so that data set comprised in the end of 190,000 spatial spots originating from the spatial grids. Um, we uh, made a registration algorithm to register all these sections on top of each other in a common coordinate system, which you then see color-coded. Color-coded um, are different, very important kind of morphological areas uh, typical for the spinal cord. Again, in orange is the ventral cord where the motor neurons reside before death. Um, the important thing to note is that in each of these 190,000 spatial spots, we actually were looking simultaneously of expression of 12,000 different genes. Um, so this is a typical result that you can get with spatial transcriptomics. Uh, so top panel is your wild type condition, okay? Bottom panel is your ALS condition. Each column is a different time point as the disease progresses. P30 means, you know, mice have reached sexual maturity. We don't expect anything to happen. 
P70 mice are a little bit older, we're still not expecting much to happen, right? We see on the histology, the motor neurons are still there. Well, at P100 and P120, which is in state to be, basically we see how the motor neuron loss progresses from the histology. So we now know also from the histology and from the symptoms um, by tracking the mice, the mice are definitely exhibiting the disease, okay? What we then see, for example, if we look at GFAP expression, which is a gene that has been previously associated with ALS progression in your bottom panel, as the disease progresses, motor neuron loss occurs at P100, P120, we see a lot of overexpression of this particular gene involved in gliosis. Uh, but to be honest, we didn't study, uh, you know, we didn't set out to study ALS to, to look at one gene at a time. So what's very cool to look at with spatial transcriptomics is something we call gene expression programs or gene uh, co-regulation programs, uh, which basically means that, oh, there's a lot of uh, different blue and red patterns and they change over time, okay? So for example, some particular cell type in the upper left corner, you know, it's very expressed, so very red in the dorsal points. Well, as the disease progresses and we follow in the diagonal, this gene co-occurrence or this gene co-expression changes from the ventral cord all the way down to the white mass, okay? So that can imply either, you know, the cells are not moving and they're communicating to each other or actual cell populations are moving within the tissue as the disease progresses. Uh, in order to kind of be able to say something more about the cell populations, we integrated spatial transcriptomics with single nucleus, or you can do single cell RNA sequencing, which means we are taking um, published reference uh, single cell or single nucleus data set in marker genes of these cell populations, and we're mapping that in concordance to our gene expression programs from the previous slide. Uh, what happens is that we now know that on the left-hand side, there are some programs that are involved with neurons. On the right-hand side, we know some pro programs are involved with vascular cells or all the vendors, okay? Um, given, you know, we created a very, very large data set, and we, of course, don't have time today to go through everything. Um, let me just show you two types of results you can expect. Um, so, um, top panel, we are looking at lock fold changes. Uh, that's on your y-axis. And we're looking at log fold changes, what's overexpressed in your AOS condition versus the wildcat condition. On the x-axis, uh, you're again going through the different time points. So P30, 70, 100, 120. So what happens, and then we're looking in the ventral form where the motor neurons are dying. We see at P100, P120, a lot of things are up or down regulated because now the motor neurons have died. And of course, any gene that we find interesting, we can also go and confirm and validate during, using these a little bit older methods like immunofluorescence, right? Like the pathologist would still do. We, we can still do that. Uh, it just takes a lot of time to validate a lot of targets, right? Uh, but I think what was more interesting is that we see upregulation of some of these programs already at the time point P7. So at P70, the, the, the mice are not exhibiting symptoms. And there's no motor neuron loss. But we see already there three symptoms that the mice are exhibiting ALS um, molecular biology. Um, and I think um, this is maybe a little bit hard to understand, but let's, you know, uh, let's try to go through it. So on the left hand side, again, you're looking at some of these gene gene combinations that popped out of the analysis. And again, you're looking at the time for P7. When the mice are not symptomatic, there's mo no motor neuron loss. Uh, what we see basically is upregulation of something that involves TIRBP as a target and TREM2 as a target. The top two heat maps, wild type, bottom two heat maps, AOS condition. Okay, so we see co-regulation of these two genes. We also see that these two genes may be a little bit harder to see on the IX is that in the ALS condition, uh, they are expressed just at the contact to the motor. So to be honest, this is probably one of the more interesting results from the study because we now have 
have managed through you know a lot of wet lab work and a lot of computational work deconvolve potential biomarkers and potential targets of disease prior to actual disease symptom and that we can actually show that these targets are expressed at the uh, boundary to the motor. So they're directly impacting the motor neurons that are about to die in the next 10 days. Uh, and I think what's even more cool is that um, this, this study and these two targets got picked up by two pharma companies and it's currently in clinical two uh, phase trials. Um, so I think what this, this whole thing that took 10 years taught me is that, well, you have to be smart when you're developing technology, but when you develop the version of the technology, you need to apply it to some, some type of actual clinical problem to see what, what are the <clears throat> excuse me, shortcomings of your technology and what can you do better. Uh, so I think we identified three things after the IL study we wanted to work. One is that we wanted to automate the whole process so that we're not no longer our students are piping and I'm not piping. Um, second is that uh, we wanted to have multimodal signatures. So this means instead of only tracking RNA expression, we wanted to check, oh, can we track protein expression? Can we track, uh, uh, track DNA expression? Uh, second is that, well, in order to know that something's going on spatial in the systems, one modality is impacting the other, we have to actually somehow perturb our system. So instead of you know uh, working a lot with crispr cas another way you can perturb is asking what happens in your guts in the presence or absence of microbiomes. Uh, and then the third, and I think probably the most important part was, well, we were um, in the initial version of technology um, continuously dependent on these voxels. These voxels um, were 100 micron in diameter, it means that you know you were capturing the cell time simultaneously expression from 5, 10, 15 cells, right? So we wanted to increase that resolution to be cellular or subcellular resolution instead of these tissue voxels. So let's start off with <clears throat> spatial multiomics. Uh, so spatial multiomics is one of these wet combined modalities type of thing. Um, so you know. We have talked a little bit today about uh, IF staining or immunofluorescence staining. So that means you're buying an antibody. Uh, this antibody is modified with a certain fluorophore, a certain color, uh, and you are basically um, incubating your tissue sections with these antibodies. Hopefully this antibody binds to the correct antigen and you're reading out uh, basically the position and the expression of this binding by uh, regular epifluorescence microscopy, I'd say. Um, there are limitations to that system is that that at the same time you can only use a few colors because of the spectral overlap between these fluorophores. So let's say that at the same time, ideally, you can do three to five antibodies, you know. Um, so we wanted to overcome that uh, so that let's say that in your reaction, you can still pipette your two immunofluorescent labeled antibodies that are binding to do different antigens and have two different colors, like site three and site five, okay. Uh, but at the same time, we're incubating our tissue sections with those antibodies, we'll actually incubate the tissue sections with DNA barcoded antibodies. So now instead of site three and site five labeling your two different antibody clones, um, you're going to have antibody clone one, DNA barcode one bind to it. And you will have antibody clone two and another DNA uh, <clears throat> barcode bound to the antibody. So after incubating your tissue sections uh, with these antibodies, what happens is that the DNA barcode with antibody again finds hopefully its correct antigen. Uh, after the DNA barcode, we made and engineered a little foliate tail. And now upon binding, this foliate tail can bind to your spatial grid and spatial. Uh, surface, same as your uh, mRNA molecules that are polyadenoid combined to the surface. And we extend from the surface. We are again popping now information um, of the barcode into some kind of a sequencing library. Um, so what happens is that if we focus a little bit on your left-hand side, so we're looking at mouse screen. In mouse screen, you have canonical architecture of white and red color. Um, far left, um, is where you actually see your immunofluorescent staining in site three and site five, right? We're looking at beautiful uh, blue, blue and red 
uh, parts of the tissue. What we see then on the right hand side is that what is the actual sequencing signal from the DNA barcode that were attached to the same antibodies in that same reaction. And so we see like quite a great correlation between, you know, sequencing uh, antibody expression and actual immunofluorescence that we are all very, very much used to. But we of course didn't develop this technology to only be able to, you know, do two antibodies at a time. Because two antibodies we could already do in green immunofluorescence, which is why we attach the DNA barcodes to the antibodies that we can multiply. We're not dependent on spectral overlap anymore. So what happened then on the right hand side? Well, you know, we can put in much more of these DNA barcoded antibodies. In, in, in fact, we put more than 50 antibodies at a time. I'm just for the purpose of screen showing you six different antibodies here. And what's other cool thing you can do then with the spatial multiomics technologies is that if on the top panel, you're looking at your protein expression or your antibody based expression uh, of the proteins in your tissue, on the bottom panel, you can map that to actual mRNA expression. So you can actually then look at some biology and how, how, how much of the mRNA and protein signals actually correlate in cells in tissues. <laughs> um, and as I said, uh, Along the way, we got very tired of pipetting these libraries and pipetting the reactions on the surface. So uh, we took the, the robot we had in the lab and we coded absolutely everything to be done on that robot. So now the only thing my students do is place a section on, on the slide and put it on the robot. The robot does rest, right? We're focused then on actual technology development and actual computation biology later on. Um, so this is a, this started off as a pet project because I was super interested in working in the gut and wanted to ask, well, you know, what, what technologies are missing in the gut? Um, started working with this 2016, 17, 18, and back then there were only literally two papers ever published on spatial organization of the microbiome in your guts. Um, and they were, I think they were pretty cool. Uh, but I was, you know, disappointed after reading them in terms of, I can only, only map two bacterial families, because again, we were dependent on immunofluorescence back then, and that's the only thing we could target in the microbiome. Okay, two fluorophores, two bacterial families. I could not know anything about the genera or the species or any lower, lower level um, resolutions in, in the microbiome. Uh, and again, I could probably do this uh, in very low throughput. Um, so, you know, one tissue section probably takes me a month or two to optimize how to do. Um, so we asked whether we can kind of re-engineer our spatial transcriptomics technology to do spatial host microbiome sequence. So what I mean by that is that, um, well, you know, um, the spatial surface, it's actually solid surface. Um, it's a glass slide. On this glass slide, you have deposited your DNA oligos. Same as I explained, you know, this, these are these DNA spots in a grid. Um, it would be a little bit too expensive to continuously buy uh, different versions of the capture set. So you remember in that first slide, I, was, I said, well, you have an Illumin adapter, you have a spatial barcode, then you have a poly DT capture. And this poly DT capture sequence um, is, you know, what you need to capture polyadenylated um, molecules. Um, so if I would, for every project I want to do, have to change this poly DT capture sequence and buy another thousand or five thousand probes, we'll probably all go bankrupt pretty soon. So instead, what we did is uh, we optimized how to enzymatically um, add or remove um, sequences on our spatial array. So in, in case of spatial host microbiome sequencing, we're simply adding a 16S capture probe. So if you're not familiar with 16S sequencing, uh, that's the most variable part of the bacterial genomes. Um, it has four different regions. We're currently targeting region four. Um, and based on sequencing of this region, we can probably uh, deconvolve 97 uh, or so percent of different bacterial species that we have currently been mapped at all. Uh, in the past 10 years. Uh, so the 16S sequence is basically used for identification of bacteria. Um, so as I said, uh, we are, have reverse engineered our own arrays uh, to now capture both 
the polyadenylate with transcripts, but also on top of that, the 16S um, variable sequences from the bacteria. Uh, actually, I think that's, that was equally as hard as coming up with a computational approach to deal with this data. Because you remember I said, you know, 2017, there was like one paper dealing with immunofluorescence and spatial organization of the gut. Well, you know, no one has actually done this before. So we started from scratch. So all the bioinformatics tools, we had to either build it ourselves or reapply what's been done on top of a lot of people, what they have tested to figure out what might work for us. Um, so we actually um, assembled a new database of uh, bacterial, um, or sorry, mouse microbiomes in the columns. We also made a new deep learning tool that maps these type of uh, data and actually super efficiently at 98% accuracy can identify bacterial genera in your data. Uh, which is, you know, if you look on the right hand side, what that actually means that Kraken 2 is probably the most popular tool you would use for bacteria and identification of your samples. DL is our deep learning model. Um, you know, they probably do a pretty good job when you're trying to classify bacteria at these higher levels, like phylum, class, order, or family. But when you actually try to see the differences bacteria, that's the genus level. Well, Kraken 2 cannot any, anymore map the data. So that's why I'm saying we put a lot of effort into uh, developing these models. Um, and then just uh, for illustration purposes, so you know how the, the gut looks like. So you're looking at cross section of a gut. You know, it's a little circle. Um, on the upper outer side of the circle, there's actual tissue. It starts off on the outer side with muscles and it moves to the epithelium in the uh, <clears throat> middle. Um, then when the tissue ends, which is probably somewhere here, uh, you have a mucus layer that contains a lot of different bacteria talking to your host cells and it contains the pellet. And pellets can contain anything from bacteria, dead cells, fibers you couldn't process and so on. Um, so what we did is uh, we have a computational tool to annotate column samples so that we actually know in which region of the column we are and in which region of the column are actual different bacteria. Um, so this is a typical result. I'm, I'm showing the expression of a gene called actin. So it's an epithelial marker. As I said, the epithelial marker or on the inside of the tissue, you see a lot of red expression, cool. That's where it should be. Like, okay, our method for, for the transcriptome is still working. We're still mapping the genes where we're supposed to map them. Uh, but then the cool part is that uh, if we're looking at two different mouse models, on the left-hand side, you're, you're looking at a germ-free mouse. Germ-free mice are the ones that don't have a microbiome, okay? They, we have depleted the microbiome out of the mice. On the right-hand side, it's an SPF mouse, or you can just call it the, your most regular laboratory mouse. It has the microbiome, everything's functioning as it should. So what we see is that with our spatial host microbiome sequencing on the right-hand side, we know that the bacteria are in the pellet and in the mucus where they actually should be. Again, Fantastic, uh, we know that the method is working. So now comes the, the fun part. So we're now focusing on this one particular very thin part of the tissue called the apex of the crypts. So the apex of the crypts are where the cells in the column are most differentiated. Those are the epithelial cells that receive the signals from the bacteria. Um, what we see in the apex of the crypt, we see expression, and I don't know if you're familiar, but on the top panel, you're looking at PXME plots. This is basically dimensionality reduction plots uh, of expression of certain bacteria. We see what we call four clusters. Um, these four clusters represent four different parts of the column, going from the apex, upper mid, mid base. So we're going from where the bacteria talk to the host cells directly, to actually how it goes down in the tissue, whether any of the actual bacteria penetrate down into the tissue, which had not been known so far. Um, so we see in the apex of the crypt a certain expression of uh, uh, bacterial gen genera. And then we, what we did, again, computationally, we mapped it on published single cell uh, and single nucleus RNA-seq data to try to decompose which cell types are actually present there and which cell types are actually talking to the bacteria in the different regions. 
Um, this is probably the toughest slide to understand, but uh, I'll do my best. So you're looking at the heat map. Uh, a lot of red means a lot of positivity and a lot of expression and a good heat value, okay? Uh, pretty simple. Uh, the heat map is split into two. The upper part is the SPS mouse. So the wild type mouse that actually has the bacteria. The bottom part is the GS mouse, the germ-free mouse that has no bacterial presence. Um, what you see on the rows is notations of uh, different uh, cell types from the previous slide. And then just next to the cell types, you see which actual bacteria are present and talking to these cell types. So what we see, for example, if we focus on the upper uh, right corner, the flavonifractor bacterial genus, is talking to different neurons, glia, enterendocrine cells, fibroblast, tough cells, okay? Let's focus on the tough cells. So the tough cells that are in the presence of bacterial genus, flavonifractor, are expressing actually, you know, some different um, uh, programs. Uh, and these gene programs are connected, for example, to toxic osmosis, plateau act activation, enzyme receptor interactions, and so on. Okay, so that means tough cells in presence of flavonifractor express these gene expression programs. Okay, let's look at tough cells uh, a little bit down when they're talking to copper coccus. When they're talking to copper coccus, they, they perform renin secretion, a completely different program, right? Uh, we can go through this task uh, all the way down, but what you see in the GF mouse is that, well, when there's presence of no bacteria, tough cells don't express these programs. So it's a direct uh, uh, way to measure crosstalk between bacteria and host cells through these gene activation programs. Um, let's just skip that. So, well, you remember I said, well, now let's stick to the, the third part we had to solve when, you know, after the AOS study is, okay, let's go back to some technology development. We knew we needed to increase the resolution of our spatial grid. So a simple way to do that, if you're looking on a spatial grid from 2016 on the left and the big tissue voxel is like, well, let's just lose a much denser grid. Um, I think that was, uh, probably the, the hardest engineering undertaking we took in the last 10 years, um, how to engineer very, very, very dense microarrays. Uh, but we were lucky that uh, we started a collaboration actually with the Illumina, who's the popular sequencing provider, but before they were a sequencing provider, they were actually a microarray provider, as most of these um, companies are these days. So um, we asked, how do we go from the left-hand side, which is our original 100 micron resolution array and 1,000 different oligos from IDP to, to, to making a very dense grid. So if you want to make a very dense grid, that means that you have to have a lot of DNA oligos and a lot of small spots. So we created a grid that's approximately, let's say, 2,000 oligos on the right and 800 oligos on the Y. Well, if you would buy these oligos from IDP, that's approximately 1.5, I think, million different oligos. And the IDP would be like the new Google and we would, you know, not exist because it would probably cost like $30 million to, to buy this. So we were of course never gonna do that. Um, but we kind of found this old technology called barcoded bead arrays. So um, actually these beads can be pretty small. I think Illumina produces them from 0.5 to 5 microns. Uh, we just chose uh, one that was pretty easy, easy to read out for us. Uh, that's two micron resolution uh, beads. Uh, but, you know, uh, these beads have to carry their own unique oligo, uh, which means we have to go through a process called bead pool generation. Uh, so we want to create a lot of different uh, beads. And but of each bead, you want to have millions of copies of the same model, same as we had in the initial uh, spatial spots, uh, which turned out to be pretty hard. But in the end, how we decided to do that is again, we chose to buy some oligos from IDT, but instead of buying 2 million oligos from IDT, we bought around 500 oligos from IDT. So what we did is we bought the first plate of oligos. In each of these uh, 65 wells, that you see on the left-hand side, 
um, we bought a different olive oil, okay? And each of these 55 wells in the plate, we added beads. With some quick chemistry, these oligos attached to the beads. So what happened is that now with 65 wells, we had 65 different uh, bead moieties, as we call them. In each of these wells, the beads all had the same oligo. What happens next is that we collect all these 65 wells worth of beads into one tube. Now in this tube, you have a mix of multiple copies of the 65 bead moieties. Uh, then we go to our second IDP plate that has a second, um, basically, uh, oligo. Uh, again, 211 different wells. In these 211 different wells, we add the, the mixed bead moiety that has the 65 different beads in the tube. So we add in each of the 200 wells some of the 65 beads. We don't know which ones. Some we add. Again, quick chemistry occurs, and what happens now is that after that reaction is done, and you have, again, collected from 211 wells all the beads in your tube, is that now your bead pool increased from 65 beads in, in a reaction to 65 times 211 different beads in your tube. Let's repeat that one more time. Again, we put now the second bead pool uh, into the, the third IDP plate with the third oligo. Again, click chemistry happens. After we collect everything in the tube, now our tube has 65 times 211 times 211 different beads. Um, and this is kind of then what actually one design on one bead looks like. So you have oligos from, from plate A, you have oligos from plate B, and you have oligos from plate C. On one bead, you have millions of copies of this one full facial oligo. Um, what you do next is that you take a silicon wafer. Um, this basically means you take silicon, you acid etch it in a particular little wells, and uh, you make certain patterns on the wafer, which look like this. Um, they're hexagonal. Uh, each little well that you etched was 2.05 microns. Uh, if you roll the two micron bead into a 2.0 micron well, means that only one bead per one well. Right? There's no space for anything else, which was great. Uh, then, you know, you have loaded your bead pool on top of this glass slide, and you have to go through a decoding process. So before, you know, we, in the old version arrays, we would buy the thousand oligos, and we know exactly like, oh, capillary goes to this oligo, and it transfers it to this position on the glass slide. There was no decoding. We know exactly where we deposited each of the 1,000 oligos. Well, now we just in a tube met synthetic oligos, right? So if we deposited them randomly on a surface, we have no clue where the oligos ended up, but we know exactly which oligos we used from the start. Um, so I don't think I have time to, to guide you through how the decoding process works. Um, I'll just tell you that, you know, it's done at Illumina. Uh, thousands of arrays are decoded by um, hybridization chemistry in about three hours. And what you get in the end is, again, your spatial array on a slide on which you can deposit tissues. Um, how to do that is that, again, section, stain, image, do the reactions on the surface, collect the polyadenoid transcripts that are binding to the DT capture sequence, extend sequence, okay? So what ends up in, you know, a 2016 technology, which is, you know, still on the tissue boxes now, you know, in 2020, 2021, we're doing HDSC or high definition spatial transcriptomics, which is after sequencing at two micron resolution. Um, so you remember, you know, how I said we, we could recapitulate what the Allen brain atlas did with, uh, with the mouse brain in a couple of days. You know, now we're actually at the better resolution than the L and brain echoes in a couple of days. We're not looking at voxels, we're looking at subcellular resolution. Um, and then again, if we're looking at the cross section on the left hand side of the mouse brain, this is the factor above, which is just the front of the brain. Um, you're looking at the left and the right hemisphere, which should theoretically be symmetrical. Um, and color coding is basically we color coded beads um, on our HDSC slide 
by, by very um, <clears throat> canonical morphology of the brain. So the known kind of regions of the brain. But then on the red, right hand side, what we're doing is it's each row is just a name for the for the region of the brain. And uh, on the X axis is all the possible different cell types we have known are previously been associated with the brain. We can map, for example, uh, three, five, and six in red. Uh, the little acronym means uh, olfactory bulb inhibitory neuron one, two, and three. Uh, we can map that particular cell type to, um, to a glenular layer that's marked in red, which is this kind of middle part of, of the mouse. Uh, again, we can finally go to our HER2 positive samples or breast scan samples that we wanted to start the study 10 years earlier. And now we can finally, you know, with HDST, map what's going on in every single cell in the biopsy that's that's being collected. Uh, and again, map a lot of gene flows as a result of that. I think now we're at the stage, so we went through, you know, another round of uh, four or five years of technology development, and now we're at the stage where we want to apply these technologies to, to answer some questions. Uh, some that I can think about would be cool to try to address in different diseases is so saying, oh, spatially, which cells are disrupted, which cell programs change in space and time. Uh, can we actually map the function of these cells to disease states? Um, you know, can we potentially come up with computational uh, approaches and algorithms that will tell us which exact communications are disrupted between cells? What are the actual extrinsic versus intrinsic cell signals? And I would very much like to work on what's the effect of the drug in the system. Not sure we're there yet with the technologies, but you know, something definitely to think about. Um, I think my my lab, you know, going forward, at least in the next year, will focus on three uh, main topics. One is how we can actually very smartly, statistically design spatial studies, which means. Well, if someone comes to you and says, I want to do a pilot, right? Uh, well, I'm saying, okay, give me one section worth of data. Uh, this one section worth of data, we can now predict, oh, I think you should do so many individuals, so many tissue sections, so many replicates, right? To be able to have enough power in your study design. So this might seem trivial, but no one has actually done power, spatial power design before. So we were also kind of, you know, reading 60, 70 year old papers to try to figure out does that any of that apply to what we're doing? And it didn't, but it at least gave us some ideas where to start. Uh, the second thing is uh, I will focus a lot on um, mapping these cell-cell interactions and communications in corrector cancer and as corrector cancer progresses uh, with a huge um, cohort, um, in my lab in Sweden that will kind of provide these samples. Uh, and then I think, you know, the third part is, um, I, I have talked to a lot of people who have tried to use Visium, you know, it's the technology that's now um, commercial by Tenex Genomics. Uh, HDSP will be as of Q1 next year. And I think everyone's stuck at the communication. Uh, they're stuck at, understanding their data. They're also stuck because they don't have the computational resources needed to actually run this data. Uh, so uh, with, with Professor Satija at NYU, we have started the collaboration of actually scalable computational design for, for spatial studies. Uh, with this, I will end to give us a little bit of time to try to chat. Um, you know, a lot of thanks to the funders and mentors. And, you know, if you have any questions, please do reach out on, on my email. So uh, that was a wonderful talk, really, so much uh, information. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Sonia, for that. And um, before we get to the Q&A, which actually I don't think we'll go into the uh, virtual Q&A, um, but I just need to call it in to the next week's uh, seminar, which is um, on Friday, October 21st. Yeah. So that will be, oh, so it is actually next week, if I, um, Friday, October 21st, the, the virtual one. You guys do have some of it. I'll do it. So, um, Professor Marianne Mitek from the University of Michigan, she presents optical diagnostics.
the pancreatic and food section. And the rest of you will be here in the regular seminars, if not live. So follow us on, on, us on social media, and uh, great to see you all. And right now, maybe we just have one time. It's already noon, I think. But it's, uh, is there one? Uh, we could take maybe one question to. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to stay as well and chat. Okay, if we yeah. vacate the room. So. All right, that sounds yeah. fine. So yeah. it's uh, it's noon. So have a great week, everybody. See you next week here. And if you have questions for um, Sonia, just please come up and uh, yeah, hang around. Yeah, awesome. Thank you.